I, David Scranton, being of sound mind and body. Well, as everyone knows, that's how a will begins. You know it from television, you know it from reading books, you know it from movies. But if you're like most Americans, you don't know it from experience. Why do I say that? Because surveys tell us that nearly 60% of Americans do not have a will or its alternative, a living trust. See, those are actually the bare minimum contents of an estate plan, which means most people don't have an estate plan at all. And that's unfortunate for a whole bunch of reasons, but the good thing is it's not hard to fix. So if you're in that group, stick around. We're gonna give you the scoop on estate plans, wills, and trusts, and why having them can dramatically boost your odds of enjoying a happy retirement. Specifically, we'll be covering what estate planning is, why so many people neglect it, the consequences of neglect, and the differences between wills and trusts, and also how estate planning aligns for income. Helping me out as usual is income specialist and best-selling author Jeff Small. We'll also hear from our special guests, author, public speaker, and television host Ed Slott, as well as advisors Sam McElroy and David Wright. And as always, we'll answer some of your questions. But right now, let's clarify just what estate planning actually is, and frankly, what it isn't. Pablo Picasso, Howard Hughes, Sonny Bono, Prince. That's not my list of celebrities that I'd invite to a dinner party, although perhaps it could be. It's just a few of the famous names who share a dubious honor, and that is, you guessed it, having died without leaving a will. Prince's story has been making the headlines ever since he died approximately five years ago at the age of 57. And to this day, his $100 million estate has not been settled. His six siblings and their attorneys have been arguing over their share of the assets this entire time. And this is a really good example of what can happen when you ignore even the bare minimum of estate planning, which again means leave it living a will or a living trust. So as a will, as I'm sure you know, specifies how you want your assets distributed after you're gone. A living trust does something similar, but actually involves naming someone to manage your affairs after you're gone. Now, while having one or the other doesn't really constitute an, a whole estate plan, they're usually the starting point. And typically an estate plan will also include additional items such as a durable power of attorney for finances. That's a legal document giving someone the authority to handle your financial affairs if you're no longer able. They can pay bills, they can write checks, they can sell assets. Next, a healthcare surrogate or proxy, which is also known as a healthcare power of attorney. That's a legal document appointing someone to make medical decisions on your behalf if you're unable. Uh, and third, an estate plan usually includes a living will or advanced healthcare directive that lets you spell out what end of life treatment you do want or don't want in case you're terminally ill or unconscious. So you might be thinking, Dave, do I really need all these things and how does it all relate to investing for income? Well, we'll be talking about that coming up in just a bit. And before I bring in Jeff, let me take a moment to answer one of your questions. Tom Jay from Texas asked, do you think inflation is going to affect the markets much in the near future? Well, Tom, uh, you know, I don't think inflation is going to be anything crazy like the 1970s. Uh, there's two schools of thought right now. There are some people that think we can have higher inflation, maybe five or six percent for three or five years. Uh, I'm in the camp that thinks that it'll, really we're going to have about a year, maybe a year and a half of a transitory inflation. Uh, so I don't see it having really a big effect on your investments much at all. Of course, that all depends upon what types of things you're invested in. So, uh, Tom, great to have your question. Thank you so much uh, for writing in from the great country of Texas. And you, too, can submit your own questions by emailing AskDave at the retirementincomestore.com. And now let's bring in my good friend and co-host, Jeff Small. Well, Jeff, uh, for once, for once, I beat you at something last weekend. I got to go out fishing and you didn't. Ha uh ha. -huh. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably got seasick. The ocean was pretty rough. Yeah, that was true. That was very true. <laughs> 
So I, I want to congratulate you, Dave, because you've you've taken a, a topic that's very boring and you've 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 brought some sex appeal to it. But you know, when it comes to estate planning, a bad finance a good financial plan can be wrecked by a poor estate plan. And nobody really does enough to polish off their estate plan so they don't leave a mess. And so creating a will, everybody thinks that they're fine, but how do they create a, a will that's legally binding? Pretty easy, right? Well, it's funny, everybody thinks you can go online and you can you know, legal zoom, you can create your own will. And technically you can, but see, here's the problem. With any other legal contract, if, 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 if I make a mistake in the contract, I can always go to court and say, well, that's not the spirit of what I said or what we agreed upon. And it may or may not hold, but at least I've got a shot. But once I'm gone, if I put something in the will that I didn't mean to put in there, it's too late. And that's the biggest negative. So I always say, if you're gonna do it, don't do it the cheap way. Don't try this at home. Get a good estate planning attorney, get a professional, do it the right way. Dave, your sex appeal just went right out the window with that long-winded explanation on estate planning. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, all right. You know, and one of the one of the other things that people do too is that you know they they go the living trust route, right? Uh, but as you know, living trusts are more complicated, right? Why? Because if you have a living trust, now you've got to you got to appoint a, a trustee. Uh, successor trustee, and then you've got to retitle all your assets. Jeff, you probably see this too. One of the biggest mistakes is that people have a living trust that some attorney drew up, but then the attorney goes ahead and gives them the bill, gets the bill paid, and maybe tells the client that they need to fund the trust by retitling assets into the trust, but most of the time their client never does. So I don't know about you, but I see people coming in with these beautifully written living trusts but not a single asset in it. So it's done really no good except for the attorney who got paid. The sad part, Dave, is you're exactly right. We see that more often than we would like. Um, but in Florida, the only person that can fund the trust with a piece of, let's say, real estate, because your personal residence normally goes in there first to avoid the probate costs, is the attorney. The attorney has to fund that. He has to prepare the deed for that and record that, that house into the trust. And so you can't do it by yourself. Yeah. In the case of real estate, that's true uh, because, of course, you have, you know, you have that one issue. But in case of other assets, whether it's just a brokerage account or bank account, I mean, you can always do that retitling on yourself. And unfortunately, most people drop the ball. But you, as you know, Jeff, one of the one of the biggest problems we have with estate planning to get down the brass tacks is is not do you have a will, do you have a trust, but it's having something, because we're we're arguments come in usually with children ultimately when mom and dad are gone is not the financial assets, as you know, it's the personal items. It's mom's costume jewelry. Uh, it's dad's fishing gear. It's things that have really uh, sentimental effect, not so much financial effect. That may be counterintuitive, but that's why it's important for mom and dad to really sit down and think in advance exactly what they want to leave to whom. So Jeff, I know you're, I know you're excited. We got Ed Slot coming up in the next block. I'm excited too, as he's an expert on estate planning in, of itself. And you stay with us. We have a lot more coming up right after the break. And it'll be interesting to see what Ed Slot has to say about these very important issues. I'm Dave Scranton. You're watching The Income Generation, and we'll be right back. I'm David Scranton. During my career, I found that most baby boomers have done a great job growing their retirement savings, yet many don't know how to convert their savings into steady income. And that is why I built the Retirement Income Store, to help hardworking Americans preserve their assets and establish steady streams of income. If you're 55 or older, our free retirement income kit is for you. It's chock full of information you need to know to get steady income during your retirement. Call 866-710-1749, online at theretirementincomestore.com. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and today we're talking about estate planning. Thanks for tuning in. And so far, we've covered the basics, wills, trusts, and so on. But now, let's take a look at some of the typical pe reasons that people overlook estate planning and the dangers of doing so. Now, when you think of an estate, you probably picture things like huge mansions with sprawling lots. And you might think, those are estates, and those are people who need estate plans, right? But culturally, that's how most of us think when we think of the term estate. In fact, in the dictionary, that's the definition of the word. But the second definition is all of the assets and property owned by a particular person. In other words, 
If you have accumulated assets, you have an estate, and therefore you should have an estate plan. Now, naturally, your assets include things like savings accounts and investments, but they also include your home, your vacation home, your vote, collectibles, heirlooms, and even items of sentimental value. Another misconception is that estate planning covers only what happens to your assets after you die, when the fact is that estate planning is also an important part of accumulating. In fact, the mere definition of estate planning is the accumulation of, protection of, preservation, ultimate distribution of your assets. So here's an example. Say you have an asset you want to leave to your son, but instead of designating him the beneficiary, you put the asset in his name, thinking that's basically the same thing. But unfortunately, it's not. Now, now that you put that asset at risk. Why? Because if the child ever gets sued, it's subject to collection by whoever is filing the suit. And if he gets divorced, half the asset now belongs to his spouse. And again, that's just one example of the way proper estate planning can help to protect your assets while you're still alive. Uh, we'll talk more about how estate planning aligns with investing for income also in just a few minutes. But now let's take one of your questions. Kim J from Wyoming. What's the best kind of annuity for a couple in their 60s with no children? Uh, Kim, great question. And the answer goes way beyond what we have here in terms of time today. Uh, and the answer is that annuity may or may not be the right answer for you. And what type of annuity really depends upon your needs. So again, I wish I could answer that more specifically. I'm sorry that I can't. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that I'm not a big fan of variable annuities, primarily because the hidden fees inside those are often two to three or even 4%. And it's kind of hard to make money when the fees are that high. So again, Kim, wish I'd give you a better answer. Uh, so I guess I could tell you maybe what not to consider, uh, but bottom line is be careful. Uh, and uh, if you ever want more help with that, be feel free to give myself or, or Jeff a call and uh, we could talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, now it's time to welcome back in Jeff and of course our special guest, Ed Slot. Ed is a public speaker and is well-versed in IRAs and retirement distribution planning. He's also a practicing CPA and has written five books, including the recently revised Retirement Savings Time Bomb and How to Diffuse It. Ed, thanks so much for being back here on The Income Generation. Great to be back with you. And it's so great to have you today uh, on the particular topics we're discussing. We're focusing on estate planning. And every day, David and I hear from folks all across the country who are concerned about not creating a huge estate for their kids, but they would much rather, if you ask them, keep their money in the family versus it going to the IRS. And it's a very simple choice. And so what happens is we amass incredible amounts of wealth in IRAs and 401ks and other pre-tax items. But then what happens when we die, Ed? We have a huge income tax. So tell us what you think some of the best strategies are to keep that money in the family. Well, here's a, a simple one. Spend more. All right, done. Spend it all. Give to charity. But if your favorite charity, like most people, is your family, then uh, you, you may have to do some things now. And now is still a great time, uh, 2021. We know what today's tax rates and brackets are. We may not know them for 22. So when you say income tax, that's for most people who have accumulated wealth in taxable, or we should say tax deferred, IRAs and 401ks. That money has not yet been taxed. So if that money gets passed to heirs, uh, that money will be taxed. That money never got a step up in basis. You know, everybody's screaming about the end of step up in basis if that even happens, I doubt it. But, but remember, for, for most people where mo their largest assets are in tax deferred accounts, that never gets a step up in basis. No matter where it ends up, whether it's your heirs, your children, grandchildren, whatever, they're going to pay an income tax. Now you can help uh, you can help decrease or reduce that tax hit by, for example, converting to a Roth IRA now. It might cost you some money now, but at least you'll be leaving them tax-free money. Or even better, you might use life insurance. I'm talking about permanent insurance as a planning tool. And just so you know, I don't. I know you guys know, but. Uh, I don't sell insurance, stocks, bonds, funds, annuities, none of that. I'm a tax advisor. 
But as a tax advisor, after the SECURE Act eliminated the big benefit of IRAs passing to heirs through the stretch IRA, I believe life insurance is the single biggest play uh, to, to uh, actually exchange bad assets for good assets. IRAs, thanks to the SECURE Act, and that was Congress's intent, have been downgraded as a wealth transfer or a state planning tool. They just don't work anymore with this 10-year rule after death and all the tax bunched into that period. Better off, if that money is intended for heirs, it's better to take those funds down now over the next few years, use up the lower brackets while they last, and then take the after-tax money, put it in a life insurance policy, the beneficiaries will get larger inheritances, more control, and less tax. And that's what everybody wants. They don't care about the vehicle that gets them there. The old well, you, IRA vehicle has pooped out. Now you need to switch to a limo. Sure. Well, you're, you're right, Ed. But when you say, I want to leave an inheritance, it polarizes people. Our viewers, our listeners, they would much rather keep the money in the family than having it go to the government. So maybe we should just say, instead of making it go to the government, here's a way to keep the money in the family. Now, everybody wants to do that because, of course, they value their family more than the IRS does, fortunately. Well, well, let, let me first tell you, you know, if you're leaving money to Uncle Sam, he's not even your real uncle, okay? So that doesn't count as family, if that's where you're getting confused. He's not a real uncle, not a real thing. Your family can get actually larger inheritances with a couple of items I just recommended and tax-free and not have to worry about all these complex yeah. tax rules. Sure, and you know, for our viewers and listeners, uh, what Ed's talking about is that you used to be able to have your heirs really take out the IRA money in small little bits and pieces over the course of their lifetime. Now it's all got to be taken out and taxes have to be paid within 10 years. But Ed, you mentioned uh, the step up in basis. Now, the Biden administration is trying to eliminate the step up in basis, which I call the tax forgiveness of death at death of non-IRA assets. Um, I'd like you to talk about that for a minute because that's gonna affect a lot of average Americans more than they realize. Right, this is why it has never passed. I don't know if anybody realizes this, but I did some research on this. The step up in basis is celebrating, if you wanna call it that, it's 100th anniversary this year. It came into yeah. the tax code in 1921, 100 years ago. And then throughout that time, whenever there was a war or financial trouble or other crises, you know, get the rich. They always said, get rid of that step up in basis. It's for rich people. And every proposal like they're talking about now never, ever passed because when they got down to it, they realized it would fall on, on all the wrong people, homeowners and small business owners. So what, but what do, you, what do you think, Ed? Do you think it's, it's gonna, it won't pass this time or do you think? I don't think so. I think no. it, it's too much of a shock to the system. Once Good. it starts hitting the real estate market and small businesses and uh, businesses that have lots of, uh, first of all, it's very hard for a small business, a family business, let's say, sure. even with all, even with step up the basis to pass to the next generation. You know, these things don't last that long, but yeah. to uh, force the next generation to pay a tax on money that's not there. It's invested in land, property, plant, equipment, all of these things. There's no yeah. money for that. That would end businesses. Even with the proposed million dollar exemption, it would create all kinds, it's too much of a shock to the system, that's, especially that's, in my opinion, uh, yeah. especially with a 50-50 Senate. Anything that out, uh, out of whack is never gonna pass. It's, too, uh, it's going to affect all the wrong people. I hope you're right. Uh, unfortunately, we all know that dead people don't vote uh, and we're going more and more left politically, so you never know what's gonna happen, but hopefully people will be able to pass their beach homes and things like that on to their children. Yeah, but then uh, without people still about have real estate. Tax. So, yeah. So, Ed, Ed, thanks so much. Unfortunately, we need to leave it there for now. Really All appreciate right. you being back on the show. It's been great. And coming up after the break, we're going to talk more about the importance of wills and trusts and how to start the estate planning process because it's easier than you think. I'm Dave Scranton. We're the income generation. Stick around. We'll be right back. For behind the scenes photos, retirement planning tips, and upcoming giveaways, follow the Income Generation Show on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch video clips, guest interviews, and to catch up on past episodes.
Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and it's great to have you here as we talk about this incredibly, as Jeff said, exciting topic of estate planning, wills, and trusts. May not be exciting, but important nonetheless. And so far, we've covered the basics of estate planning and why having an estate plan is important. We also talked about some of the common misconceptions that might cause you to neglect estate planning. Next, we're going to take a closer look at some of the key ingredients. You see, it's important to not only have a good financial plan, but to have a plan that's right for you. And the same is true when it comes to estate planning. For many people, a will is the right foundation for their estate plan. But for you, the better option might just be a living trust. And again, that's where you name a trustee to manage your affairs after you're gone. So let's say that you have a beneficiary that you think might not act responsibly with a lump sum inheritance. With a living trust, you can stipulate that the money is given out at certain times or under certain circumstances. Now, there's another reason for a living trust too, and that's you don't want your assets to go through probate because when they go through probate, they become public knowledge. And that nosy neighbor you always had now knows everything that you own and your net worth. Okay? Also, a trust can be harder to contest than a will. And the distribution of assets is usually quicker than a will. Because again, when you have a will, uh, you, your assets go through probate. And naturally, you want to pick just the right person to manage your trust, and estate planning can help you do that. And that's also true when it comes to assigning other roles in your estate plan, which again would include financial power of attorney, healthcare surrogate, administrator of your advanced healthcare directive. They're all important. In many cases, the financial power of attorney could be one of the most important. And again, it specifies is who has the authority to make financial decisions on your behalf. And there are different options for how this works. One is an immediate power of attorney, which means you're giving someone the right to sign off and make decisions today. But the more common choice is a springing power of attorney. This simply doesn't become active until a doctor signs off and says that you are no longer able to make your own financial decisions. Now, I know this can all sound a bit daunting, right? But starting the process of estate planning is a lot easier than you think. So let's get to another one of your questions. Becky from Illinois says, I'm more interested in investing for income as I get older, but I get nervous about radically changing my plan. Should I be? Well, Becky, uh, that's got absolutely nothing to do with estate plan, but a great, a great question nonetheless. And, and you shouldn't be because you can do it gradually. And for example, if you think, you know, uh, if you think this means that 10 years out of retirement, you get everything out of the stock market and you buy all bonds, it's not necessarily true. Because you can stay in the stock market, but transfer slowly to more higher dividend yielding stocks. So if the stock market continues to surge upward, you can still benefit from the gain. So Becky, again, uh, absolutely great question. Um, and again, you two could submit your questions uh, by going to AskDave at the retirementincomestore.com. Now, let's bring back in Jeff. So Dave, you know, we spend our entire lives accumulating an estate. But you know, if we want to be responsible for what we've accumulated, we have to do proper estate planning. And you know, most folks have had experiences as an executor or co-trustee or somebody in their family has, and they've seen the expenses that can, that can be levied on the estate. So we have to do something called a living trust to avoid the first phase of those expenses and avoiding probate, correct? Um, it's certainly one way to do that. That's right. I mean, there's other ways to avoid probate, as you know. Um, IRAs avoid probate because you put a beneficiary designation right on them. If you have a savings account or brokerage account, you could do a TOD or a POD, a transfer on death, payable on death. That avoids probate, right? Um, and I, I, you know, we're, we've been friends long enough. I know you actually have those TODs and PODs, right? Um, annuities avoid probate. Life insurance avoid probate, avoids probate. Real estate, though, is sometimes the toughest thing. And a lot of people use living trusts, as you know, primarily for real estate. They do. And, you know, because that's because it's tangible and you don't want to put somebody's name on it. And so, you know, if you have property in more than one state that is in real estate, guess what? You're going through probate twice. If you have property in three states, you're going through probate three times because each state or locale has their own rules on probate. Yeah, right. That's right. And that's, that's called ancillary probate in another state. You know, it's bad enough to do probate in one state, the state in which you reside, let alone your, your, your executor having to have probate in two or three different states because you own properties there, right? So, but we're talking about, I want to make this clear, Jeff. These are living 
trust. These are revocable trusts. In other words, you could put the assets in a trust today, you could change your mind a few years later, you could pull them all back out, you can close down the trust. The trust becomes irrevocable or unchangeable only after you die. Now, but as you know, Jeff, there are also some reasons why somebody might want to put money while they're alive in an irrevocable trust, correct? Well, that's true. There are people that want to put money in an irre irrevocable trust. When they want to remove the asset from their estate, either from a medical issue or potentially for a special need, Dave. That's right. And moving your estate, ir irrevocable means just that. It means you can no longer access it. Now, the irrevocable trust could say, hey, I'm going to get the interest income from this asset for a while. If it's a rental property, maybe I get the rental income. Um, if if uh, it could it could say that you know maybe some of this can come back under certain limited circumstances, but for the most part, an irrevocable trust is just that irrevocable. You've given it away. So as you know, Jeff, most of the time it's not people our age are doing irrevocable trusts. It's people that are at a more advanced age that are really at a point where you know they know for sure they're not going to need or want that money. And that's something I want to ask our next guest about, Jeff, who's got a lot of experience in, that, in this area, and that's Sam McElroy, Chief Executive Officer of Stride Financial in Chicago. And as you know, Sam is an income specialist with our very own retirement income store and has years of experience in helping clients uh, really plan for the exact same types of things we're talking about today. So Sam, it's great to have you back here on the Income Generation. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So Sam, in your experience, do most of your clients understand the importance of having a comprehensive estate plan? You know, the thing is, Jeff, I would say most of them don't. Uh, there's a widely held misperception that only the mega wealthy really need to have an estate plan. And I think that's because people don't understand uh, what happens when you don't have one. Uh, and in a lot of instances, people spend a lifetime accumulating this wealth. And if things go according to plan, they should have a considerable amount left over by the time they're out of this world. So you have to have a thorough idea of how you're going to you know, easily transition that to your loved ones or nonprofits or wherever you want those funds to go. So personally, Sam, as an advisor, I've seen a lot of really sad stories resulting from someone not having any planning. How about you? Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I have seen situations where people have accidentally disinherited part of their family. Uh, I've seen situations where they handcuff the money to a degree that the very people they were trying to benefit couldn't get out of the institutional trustees. Uh, I've seen so many different issues where poor estate planning has negated the benefits they were trying to create in the first place that it almost would have been better if they didn't do it you know, just to start with. So you have to be really intentional and thorough in your methodology and how you construct it. So getting your estate plan done correctly is really about not leaving a mess is what it sounds like you're describing. Yeah, it's really about protecting the very loved ones that you're trying to benefit. But a thorough estate plan isn't just about where the money goes after you die. There's a lot of things that you need just to take care of you while you're living as well. I remember one story where because a couple failed to have a power of attorney document for, uh, for finance, there was a situation where one of them actually needed to have some additional medical work done and they couldn't get the equity out of their house, which was one of their largest assets. So there's a lot of things that kind of go into it, both to protect you while you're living, as well as making sure that there's no arguments or contention or fighting once you're gone. And isn't it true, Sam, that oftentimes the, the fighting uh, is more about non-financial assets. It's about personal assets that have sentimental value more than financial value. That is 100% true. Um, it's usually the things that people fight over more so than the money itself. Uh, I remember one situation in particular, and this was a family that had some really old heirlooms, uh, some rifles that went back to the Revolutionary War and other things like that. It was a long military family. And after the death of the grandparents that had a lot of these things, there were four brothers and sisters and they basically descended on the house. They all rifled through all the things that were there. And uh, to this day, no, 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 no pun intended, right? <laughs> right. No pun intended. Exactly. But to this day, uh, they don't really speak to each other the way that they used to. I mean, you, you had a trajectory for generations to come materially altered because of infighting over things. Well, I just learned something from you today, Sam. I never knew that at some point in history, you were allowed to own a rifle in Illinois. That's news to me. Sam, it's a great having you on the show as usual. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.
And coming up, we're going to be talking more about how to get your estate planning rolling and how to coordinate it with your retirement income plan, along with our special guest, David Wright. I'm David Scranton. This is the Income Generation, and we'll be right back. I'm David Scranton. When it came time for my mom to retire, one simple mistake forced her to work years longer than she should have. And that's why I started the Retirement Income Store, to help hardworking Americans, 55 and over, plan for the retirement they deserve. I couldn't help my mom, but maybe I can help you. If you're 55 or older, please claim our free Retirement Income Kit, chock full of information you need to know to get steady income during your retirement. Call 866-314-7227, online at theretirementincomestore.com. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. Glad you could join us. Today, as you know, we're discussing estate planning, wills, trusts, and all the stuff that comes along with it. And yes, it's a huge topic, and we've covered a lot, including what's in an estate plan, how having one actually protects your assets before and after death. Also, the value and importance of trusts and powers of attorney, and much more. But now let's talk about how to get started. One good way to start uh, an estate plan is with a family meeting. Those impacted by your plan should probably be informed ahead of time. This might also mean, uh, or be, I should say, a good time to talk about which family members would feel most comfortable in certain roles. Maybe one child's more suited to being your healthcare power of attorney, while another one would be a better choice for financial power of attorney. So once things are clarified on the personal side, you can then move to the legal side. And that doesn't have to be a frustrating or daunting process. Bottom line is that many income specialists actually work in tandem with estate planning attorneys on behalf of their clients. And very often, they can help you find the right attorney in your area. And if you think about it, that makes sense because the right time to start estate planning is the same time that you're creating a financial plan to meet your retirement goals. And generally, that means within about 10 years of retirement. Remember, Prince was only 57 when he died without an estate plan. He should have worked with an estate planning attorney and an advisor to create a plan at least one or two years earlier. Here's the point. Estate planning isn't something you save until you're confined to a hospital bed or you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness. It's a step you take to prepare for those possibilities and to be really better insured that your assets are well protected in the meantime. So now let's take another question from you. Mike from Florida asks, how might retiring abroad affect my decision to switch to investing for income? Well, Mike, great question. And really it has to do with where your assets are invested because you have currency risk. So let's say that you continue to invest in US investments, but you retire abroad. Okay? And let's say that the dollar all of a sudden starts to weaken relative to whatever currency exists in the country in which you retired. Well, now the financial assets here in the United States could do really well, but if the dollar is weakened, when you try to translate back to the currency that you're actually going to be spending, you could be losing money. Now, of course, that can go in the other direction, but that's an additional risk. So you want to consider having at least a good chunk of your assets invested in the same currency in which you're actually spending money. So Mike, uh, great question. Uh, and again, uh, you too can go and submit your questions by going to AskDave at the retirementincomestore.com. Now, let's bring back in Jeff so that, Jeff, we can talk more about how uh, simple it can be, really, to start the estate planning process. So, Dave, it's really easy to start an estate plan, but the barrier to doing that usually is cost, because sometimes attorneys charge a lot. But it's a very small amount of money considering that you're planning your entire estate. So folks really have to take that first step forward, find a good estate planning attorney who's going to work in unison with their financial advisor. They must work in coordination to perfect their estate plan, Dave. Well, you're right. And, you know, we talked about how if you die with a will, your assets go through probate. And that just costs a little bit and it delays the receipt of the assets by your heirs. And, yeah, it's public record. But if you're a prince and you died what's called intestate without the will, now the court fees are absolutely enormous. And you know that there are a lot of attorneys out there that'll, that'll do an estate plan for under $1,000. So it, it doesn't have to be cost prohibitive. I mean, it costs a lot more than that to, to die without an estate plan, right? 
No, there's no doubt. But the most important thing for our viewers and listeners to know is to find a competent, qualified attorney who specializes in estate planning because that gives them the basis for getting it done correctly. They've got to work with a qualified attorney. And if you don't know who that is, then it's really simple. Just really, you know, go to your advisor who's an income specialist. Now, they have to be an income specialist because income specialists like you, like myself, right, we specialize in working with people over the age of 50. So typically, we'll have relationships with good estate planning attorneys. Uh, so go to your advisor who's an income specialist and that he, he or she can refer you to the right attorney. Not somebody that does a lot of home closings or, or banks or bankruptcy filings or divorce, you know, family law, but somebody who specializes in state planning. No, there's no doubt about that, Dave. But, you know, as a side note, even though we didn't talk about it, we want to make sure that when we get into our 80s, when we really need estate planning, that we also have the assets to protect ourselves from health care expenses and making sure we can remain independent and autonomous to a certain degree. And that may not necessarily mean health care expenses, but that is also a very overlooked function of estate planning, in addition to everything you've covered today, Dave, which was phenomenal, by the way. Well, well, thank you. But remember, I didn't do it myself. You helped. Um, but yeah, you're right. So powers of attorney, right? If, if your spouse has to go to court every time that he or she wants to make a change or withdraw from your IRA, think about how much money that adds up to be, okay? Healthcare, like you said. Imagine if you don't have a living will that's within, let's say, two years, right? Because a, a five-year-old living will, most doctors won't accept. But if you don't have one within two years and you're unconscious, your spouse can go in there and say, hey, you know, he or she wants to pull the plug. That was their goal. And the doctor says, well, that, that's a great story, but I don't have that in writing. It's not current. And now you have to pay for staying on life support for the rest of your life. And that can essentially, like Terry Schiavo, that, that can really drain, as you know, the largest of estates. Uh, but next, Jeff, as you know, we have a guest coming up who's actually a state planning expert in his own right. And that's, uh, no pun intended, David Wright. David is the founder of Wright Financial Group in Toledo, Ohio, and has been helping clients navigate these types of issues now for over 30 years. He's an income specialist, of course, with our very own retirement income store, and he's also an investment advisor representative. Dave, thanks so much for being such a good friend of the income generation. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. Hi, Jeff. So, Dave, why is basic estate planning a good financial plan? It's a good financial plan because you want to have a well-coordinated plan, one that has income, certainly, but you want to make sure that that income continues after you're not here anymore. Obviously, people need to look at beneficiary designations, and we do that all day long with IRAs and 401ks and all that stuff. But if you're really doing your job as a fiduciary, you take a look at the entire uh, client's net worth, what they have in real estate, rental property, making sure all of this stuff passes adequately at death with the least amount of taxes and minimizing probate along the way. So you said something really important about minimizing taxes. And so most people won't have an estate tax, Dave. You've got to be worth more than you know, 10 million plus to have an estate tax. But, but a lot of people will have income taxes on their assets, correct? That's true. I mean, when, when they pass property, obviously prop, some property gets a step up uh, basis at death. But obviously, if they've got bank accounts, brokerage accounts, things that aren't titled properly, they can be in a position where they are going to be paying some income taxes in respect of decedent, also some other probate costs that they could avoid. And another thing that I see quite often, Jeff, is people don't take the time to update uh, their durable powers of attorney as well as their living wills. They, they got to make sure that these things are current. Uh, just as much as every two, three years, making sure that their property is going to pass and the documents are up to date. Because if you're not here to take care of your own uh, events, if you're sick or under the weather, you got to have somebody be able to step in and help you with uh, medical decisions as well as financial decisions on your assets. And Dave, you're right. That's an important point. We didn't talk about that. We talked a lot about getting the estate plan set. But the fact is you've got to update it on a regular basis, not just the living will, but also, you know, maybe something changed. Maybe, you, you know, maybe the person you thought was going to be your co-executor shouldn't be your executor, right? How many times do you see wills and trusts with outdated information and the people have totally forgotten about it, right? 
That's right, David. Uh, good point, because a lot of times we're making the phone call to their investment companies. Perhaps the, the uh, particular client isn't able to make decisions for themselves. If that document has not been updated in the past five years, a lot of these financial institutions, 401k uh, plans, they won't recognize the document simply because it's out of date. They don't have proof that the client's still married or this person they nominated on the durable power of attorney is even still somebody that they speak to. So it's important to make sure that you have something current that financial institutions will accept uh, in your particular case. Or even worse, sometimes you have a client sitting in front of you that's of sound mind. You call the IRA custodian that they currently have, and guess what? Their ex-spouse is still the beneficiary, right? And the look of horror on their face when they realize that. So, exactly. Dave Wright, as usual, it's been our pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Righto. Good seeing you guys. And also, Jeff, as usual, a big thank you to you. But most importantly, thanks to all you all for being regular viewers, regular listeners. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've had a blast today. Bottom line, if you're close to or you're in retirement and you're concerned about your money, as you know, it's essential you stay informed and up to date. And right here is where you can do it on the income generation. I'm David Scranton, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>